you would take your Bibles this morning and turn to Romans the third chapter. Romans chapter 3 will be where we begin this morning. So wonderful for us to be able to gather and to worship our God today, the great and wonderful King of the universe. So good to be with you. I look forward to meeting you, spending time with you, and hopefully this week growing together as brothers and sisters in Christ. Our greatest desire this week would be that if you are not a Christian, That something could be said in the course of these lessons that causes you to think about being a child of God. Or if you need to make your life right with God in any kind of way to grow closer to Him, we certainly want to see that happen this week as well. As was mentioned, my wife Susan is with me. She's the best part of this thing. And I'm glad that she could come with me. It's always wonderful to have her with me in these gospel meeting efforts. Anything that I can do for you this week, even behind the scenes, let me know. I certainly will be more than happy to do that. Good to see you this morning. In Romans, the third chapter, the Apostle Paul says to these who he is speaking to, he says, what advantage then has the Jew? What is the prophet of circumcision? Much in every way, chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God. If any people should have been primed and ready to come to Jesus, it should have been the Jews. I mean, after all, they had the promises that had been made to Abraham, one of which was the promise of a great seed that would bless all nations. They had the law of Moses, which according to Galatians chapter 3 was designed to lead right up to Christ. And they had those prophecies that spoke about the suffering servant of God that would heal us of our wounds. The question comes up, why didn't those advantages help them? If they had so many advantages, why didn't those advantages help them? That brings me to the premise of my lesson this morning, and it's simply this. And that is that an advantage, let me go back, an advantage is not an advantage unless you take advantage of it. It'll take me a little time to get used to the new clicker. Isn't that so true? Here we are with our advantages, but they hold no help to us whatsoever if we don't take advantage of our advantages. And so that's what we're going to speak on this morning as I help us to look at some advantages that so many of us have. And the question that we're going to be raising is what do we do with that? How does God feel about it? How does God feel about those advantages that we have in our lives? First of all, I'd like for us to consider Luke the 11th chapter and verse 32. In Luke, the 11th chapter, in verse 32, Jesus seems to me to address this matter when he says in Luke 11, in verse 32, the men of Nineveh are going to rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. What's Jesus saying? Well, he's saying that there was a man named Jonah that went out on a sea, and because of his rebellion against God, they had to throw him overboard to stop that storm. And as soon as they threw him overboard, he was swallowed up by a great fish. And he was in the belly of that fish for three days and three nights. And then as he repented, he was vomited up on land. And all of a sudden, he appears in the city of Nineveh through God's rebuke, and he preaches to them, and he says, "'Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown.'" And all the people of Nineveh in sackcloth and ashes repented at the preaching of Jonah. They believed. But Jesus' point is, is that here comes the Son of God. He performs miracle after miracle after miracle, preaching as they said, never a man spake like this man. And then he is killed for his preaching of the word of God. And after three days and three nights in a tomb, just as Jonah had been, he arises from the dead, presents himself alive with many signs and wonders and many manifestations over the next, next 40 days. And yet they still didn't believe. His point is simply this. They had Jonah. You had Jesus, the son of God. On the day of judgment, they're going to condemn you. You had an advantage that was far greater than they ever had. Why didn't you take advantage of your advantage? Now we come to Luke the 12th chapter. 
In Luke, the 12th chapter, Jesus is talking about being ready when the master comes, that he will find us having done what we were supposed to do. We'll back it up to verse 47. It says, that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will, he shall be beaten with many stripes. But he who did not know yet committed things worthy of stripes, he shall be beaten with few. And then you have this wonderful statement. He says, for everyone to whom much is given, much will be required. And to whom much has been committed of him, they will ask the more. Do you see the idea? What our Lord is telling us is that when we have been given much, much is going to be required. With great privileges come great responsibility. With advantages comes the expectation that we will take advantage of every one of those advantages. That's where we go this morning. Let's look at a few of them. First of all, I want to talk about the matter of godly parents. Sometimes when I'm at places like this and other places preaching the gospel, I'll just tell you, sometimes I have to pinch myself to see if it's real. I just can't believe that God lets me do this. That I get to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to people week after week after week after week. And I want to tell you, that is so humbling to me. As far as I'm concerned, I have the greatest job in all of the land. I get to hear the greatest news that men will ever hear. And to be even counted worthy of just handling the gospel is so humbling to me. What I want to say to you this morning, though, is that I don't think I would be here this morning if it were not for having godly parents. I was raised up in a godly home. I had this thing dropped in my lap from the time that I was little. And some have not had that advantage. I think about a lady who brought a young kid to church with her on one occasion. And she told me as she brought this neighbor kid who had never been to church. She said that she was inviting him and said, I'd like for you to go to church with me and we'll learn about God. And he said, who is he? That's astounding to me. That a child is is mentioned to, the, the mention of God is made to him and he says, who is he? Will that child ever preach God's word? Will he ever obey the word of God? And yet I wonder how old I was the very first time it was said to me, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. What an advantage to be born to parents who knew the truth. I was born to parents who knew it from the very beginning. I could have been anybody's son. Why was I born to them? I don't know. But I tell you what I do know, it's an advantage. And God is going to expect me to take advantage of that advantage. Faith passed down. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 1. Timothy had that advantage. And Paul reminds him of it in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 5. He says in 2 Timothy 1 and verse 5 that Timothy, I, I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you. Where did he get it? The genuine faith that is in you that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and then in your grandmother, and your mother Eunice rather, and I am persuaded is in you also. Here is grandmother Lois. Here is mother Eunice. Faith passed on down to Timothy. What a wonderful thing Timothy had in his life. And then Deuteronomy chapter 6 is one of my favorite go-to places as I think about what can happen in a family. I love it here because what you have is you have a dynasty spiritually. You have you and your son and your grandson. And the desire is to, to bring every one of those to the faith. In verse 6, you shall love the Lord your God. Verse 5, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. There's the idea of being in a home where God is the context of the entire day. Verse 8, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be as frontless between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house 
and on your gates. Perhaps some of you live in a home where there's things on the walls that remind you of the presence of God. I've been in homes where I would often see maybe on the wall, as for me in my house, we will serve the Lord. Maybe at the dinner table, it says upon the wall there, and they ate their food with gladness and singleness of heart. Many of us have reminders to our children all over the place that we love God and that all of this is about God. The whole context is about God. So here's what I come to, young people. Were you raised in the home of godly parents? Have you had this in your hands since the time that you were little? What are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with the advantage that God has given you in having parents like that? I want to read a piece to you. It's called, It's Your Move, Daughter. But you could say easily, It's Your Move, Son. I gave you life, but I cannot live it for you. I can teach you things, but I cannot make you learn. I can give you directions, but I cannot always be there to lead you. I can allow you freedom, but I cannot account for it. I can take you to church, but I cannot make you believe. I can teach you right from wrong, but I cannot always decide for you. I can buy you beautiful clothes, but I cannot make you lovely on the inside. I can offer you advice, but I cannot accept it for you. I can give you love, but I cannot force it upon you. I can teach you to be a friend, but I cannot make you one. I can teach you to share, but I cannot make you unselfish. I can teach you respect, but I cannot force you to show honor. I can advise you about your friends, but I cannot choose them for you. I can tell you about the facts of life, but I cannot build your reputation. I can tell you about drink, but I cannot say no for you. I can warn you about drugs, but I cannot prevent you from using them. I can talk about lofty goals, but I cannot achieve them for you. I can teach you about kindness, but I cannot force you to be gracious. I can love you as a daughter, but I cannot place you in God's family. I can pray for you, but I cannot make you walk with God. I can teach you about Jesus, but I cannot make him your Savior. I can teach you to obey, but I cannot make Jesus your Lord. I can tell you how to live, but I cannot give you eternal life. Thanks for listening, Mama. Some have not had this advantage. But if you have, I want to say, I don't think I could come up with a single explanation before the God of heaven as to why I never became what I needed to become. I had it in my lap from the very beginning. I had godly parents. I want to talk about another one. The matter of being a keeper at home. In Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. Paul centers in on various roles and responsibilities of different ones in the church. And when he comes to Titus 2 and verse 3, he says there, The older women likewise, that they are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they admonish the young women to love their husbands and to love their children. To be discreet, chaste, homemakers, the King James Version says keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God might not be blasphemed. Shouldn't there be some real advantages to being keepers at home? You think about all the precious memories that you're going to be able to build with your children by by doing that. Just this past week, Susan got on an old computer and was trying to pull some things off. And we came across a little video of my grandson. Oh, I don't know. He may have been about four. And he's holding his his little baby sister that had just been born. And he's singing, I praise his name. He's so good to me. And then he kisses his little baby sister on the cheek. Oh, what a memory to have forever. Think of all the moments that you can take to help your children to see God. Think of all the Bible stories that you can share with them. 
The moments when they can tag along beside you as you go to maybe try to serve others that need a helping hand. Think of the purity of heart that your children can keep for so much longer. I want to tell you, I'm persuaded it is a major advantage. But it won't be a major advantage if you forget what being a keeper at home really means. It's not really about the matter of dusting and mopping and vacuuming. There's verses that deal with that. For example, in 1 Timothy 5.14, it says that a, a woman is to manage the house. And I believe maybe that takes care of, of some of those matters. But when the Bible talks about being a keeper at home, it's not about cleaning house. It's about guarding your children. I sometimes compare it to in the Bible where one is referred to as a keeper of the prison. <laughs> now, we don't run prisons. But one who is a keeper of the prison, you know what they're doing? They're trying to keep some things out that they don't want in. They're trying to guard the place from, from something that might come in and, and hinder what they're trying to do. That's the idea of being a keeper at home, that you are continually guarding your children from evil influences, filling them with godly influences. You're a keeper at home. But I'll say this, I mean, it's possible to get so absorbed in your chores that you still find, fail to, to, to spend time with your kids. It's possible to be one who is a keeper at home, but yet you still don't spend much time with them. This is called babies don't keep. Mother, oh mother, come shake out your cloth. Empty the dustpan, poison the moth. Hang out the washing and butter the bread. Sew on a button and make up a bed. Where is the mother whose house is so shocking? She's up in the nursery, blissfully rocking. Oh, I've grown as shiftless as little boy blue. Lullaby, 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 Lou. Dishes are waiting and bills are coming to you. Pat a cake, darling, and peek peekaboo. The shopping's not done and there's nothing for stew. And out in the yard, there's a hullabaloo. But I'm playing kanga, and this is my roux. Look, aren't her eyes the most wonderful hue? Lullaby, rockaby, lullaby, Lou. Oh, cleaning and scrubbing will wait till tomorrow, but children grow up as I've learned to my sorrow. So quiet down, cobwebs. Dust, go to sleep. I'm rocking my baby because babies don't keep. Indeed, life goes faster than we think. I think about the woman who said, I hope my children look back on today and remember a mother who had time to play. There's plenty of time for cleaning and cooking for our children grow up while we're not looking. Major advantage. But it won't be an advantage if you grow frustrated with them being under your feet. Some time back, I heard about a mother who had 10 children. <laughs> Bless her heart. <laughs> And one of the youngest ones was home that day and all day long, I mean, she's just tripping over him and, 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 and stepping on him and everything else all through the day. I mean, he's just right under her feet. And finally, in frustration, she says to him, what are you doing? Why are you acting this way? And he looked up, with me, up at me with sweet green eyes and said, well, mommy, in primary, my teacher told me to walk in Jesus' footsteps but I can't see his, so I'm walking in yours. Oh, isn't that it? I gathered Lynn in my arms and I held him close. Tears of love and humility spilled over from the prayer that grew in my heart. A prayer of thanks for the simple yet beautiful perspective of a three-year-old boy. It's an advantage. I'm dating myself here, but it won't be an advantage if your children see you watching as our stomach turns. It was as the world turns years ago. We cannot let our children see us watching filth in those hours. I mean, isn't it about guarding them? About being a keeper at home? What's that premise? An advantage is not an advantage unless you take advantage of it. 
Well, then there's the matter of our nice homes. Our homes are a great advantage. As you know from the New Testament, they, they did gather with one another from house to house, and it's such a, such a great blessing. But have you ever said, you know, when we get this bigger house, we're going to be able to have a lot of people over. <laughs> I've heard that so many times. Oh, when we, we get this really nice big house, we'll just be able to have so many people over. And that's a great thing. But will your little household too? Will your little household two people? The thing is, if we're not taking advantage of what we have right now, then what's to make us think that we'll do any better when we have more? Use what we have now. And can I just say to you, you don't have to have much. Can you turn to 2 Kings 4 with me? In 2 Kings chapter 4, Elisha, the prophet of God, makes his circuit as he often would. And he is going to need somewhere to stay. But in 2 Kings chapter 4, beginning in verse 8, it says, It happened one day that Elisha went to Shunem, where there was a notable woman, and she constrained him to eat some food. And so it was, as often as he passed by, that he turned in there to eat some food. And she said to her husband, Look now, I, I know that this is a holy man of God who passes by us regularly. Notice verse 10. Please let us make a small upper room on the wall. And let us put a bed for him there, and a table, and a chair, and a lampstand. And so it will be whenever he comes to us that he can turn in there. And it happened one day that he came there and he turned into the upper room and lay down there. I love that passage. <laughs> because it just shows that we don't have to have so very much. As a preacher of the gospel, I have stayed in some wonderful places. I have stayed in places that had the most lavish of accommodations. And I have enjoyed that so much and have been so thankful for it. But I'll just tell you, if I go somewhere and they've got a small room and a bed and a table and a chair and a lampstand, I'm a king. I've got all I need. This week, you're providing me with those very things. I've got a, a bed and a table and a chair. and a lamp. <laughs> I've just got everything I need. You don't have to have much. Don't ever think that you have to have much. A preacher friend of mine talks about, and he goes a lot of places. He talks about a place that he went to one time, and he said, the, the best way I know to describe this house that I went to, he said, it was just basically a shack. And he said, we got in there, and it was just kind of a one-room thing. He said, over here was a cook stove, and over there was a bed. And he said, we got ready to eat, and he said, we sat down at the table, and it was a card table. And he said, uh, they gave me the best chair that they had, and it was a lawn chair. And he said, best I remember, the meal consisted of a single chicken and some salad. He said, it was so good. He said, but the best thing was we must have talked for a solid hour or more about God and about Jesus and about spiritual things and questions about the Bible and discussion about the Bible. And he said, and after the meal, he said, the man said, hey, uh, I, I want to show you my refrigerator. And so he said, I got looking around for a refrigerator and he started walking out the door. <laughs> He said, he walked me out back a little ways behind the house and we came to a little stream that kind of fell into a pool of water and there was a rope going over into that pool of water. And he said, he went back there and he lifted up that rope and when he pulled the rope up, there was a jug of milk at the end of that rope. That's how he kept that cold. And my friend said, I've been in a number of places, but I've never been in any home that I enjoyed more than that home. It's about just opening our hearts to people. It's about opening up what I have to give from here. You don't have to have much to be a great blessing to others. 
what an advantage our homes are. Two more points, the lesson's yours. There's the matter, I went the wrong way again. (laughs) There's the matter of gospel preaching. In Hebrews, the fourth chapter, Hebrews, the fourth chapter, the writer of Hebrews is warning about not falling away. And he says in verse 1, Therefore, since the promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear, lest any of you seem to come short of it. And the message there is don't come short, don't fall short. Verse 2, For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. What he's saying is, is those people back there heard the gospel too. Those Old Testament people were hearing good news. There was a promised land out before them, but the word that they heard did not profit them. Why? Because it never got mixed with faith. They heard it, but they did not trust and they did not obey. And he's saying, don't let that happen to you. I want you this morning to think with me about the advantage of gospel preaching. And being able to take that truth every Lord's Day and all the other times you get together, take that truth, mix it with faith, live it out, and go to heaven when you die. Have you ever thought about what a great blessing it is just to be able to hear gospel preaching? You know, when I read Luke chapter 16, and it talks about the story of the rich man and Lazarus, you know the story. They both died Lazarus finds himself in Abraham's bosom. The rich man finds himself in torment. And when I read through that text, there are some terrifying words. I read in that text that he cried. And I read in that text that he said, have mercy on me. And I read where he said, just let Lazarus dip his finger in water and touch it to my tongue for I am tormented in this flame and cool my tongue. But I've often said there's one word in Luke 16 that terrifies me more than any of them. It's the word remember. Remember? He says to the rich man, do you remember that in your life you had good things and likewise Lazarus evil things? Remember? I think the idea is that he's teaching, don't you remember all of the advantages that you had in life? How many lessons had he heard? I don't know. But no matter how many he heard, they didn't help him. They never got mixed with faith. Gospel preaching is not an advantage to us unless we take it and make it a part of our lives. Somebody once said, hell begins on the day when God grants us a clear vision of all that we might have achieved, of all the gifts that we wasted, of all that we might have done that we did not do. If I don't take advantage of the most important things, I'll have a long time to think about it. What's that premise? An advantage is not an advantage unless you take advantage of it. And then this. Just access to the Bible and the study of it. In my prayers... One of the most common things that I pray to God, I kind of follow that formula, A, C, T, S, adoration, confession, thanksgiving. When I'm in the T section and I'm praying about things to be thankful for, one of the most common things that I say is, God, I thank you that I can read the Bible. I thank you that I can read You ever thought about what a great blessing it is just to be able to read? Somebody once said, the man who does not read has no advantage over the one who can't. Isn't that true? Here's one man who doesn't read because he doesn't know how. Here's another man who does not read because he doesn't want to. What advantage is it 
to be able to read if we don't do it. Just having access to the Bible. We need to think about what a great and wonderful advantage that is. Bob Buchanan told a story several years ago about a trip that he took to Romania. Flew on an airplane, which by the way, that's a lot better than Paul had. That's another great advantage. And yet we have quick ways to get places and still sometimes preachers struggle to gather the support that's needed to go. But Bob told a story about going to Romania and he said my intent was to take Bibles to Romania. They were just allowing people to start to come in. But you know, sometimes things are slow to break down. He said, I got in a car, I put the Bibles in the back of the car and I got to my place to come into Romania. And I get to the gate and there's a man there, he's a bit rude to me and he doesn't speak any English and he points to the car and he parks, points to the trunk and he's obviously wanting to know what's in the trunk and I think, oh no. It wasn't wrong for him to take them in but he opens the trunk, the man points to the box, wants to see what's in the box, he opens it up and it's Bibles. And this man then spoke the first word of English he had spoken the entire time. He said, Never! And he would not allow Bob into Romania. Bob traveled a little ways down and stopped and pulled over to the side of the road. And he says, to be honest with you, I cried like a baby. Somewhere in that, something hit me that, Bob, quit your crying and pray to God. And he said, I prayed to God. And I got my map out and I discovered that there was one other place that I could get into Romania, but I'd have to drive a long way. He said, I drove that distance and I got there. He said, when I got there, there was a man there at the gate. Same thing again. He stops the car. He said, this man speaks a little English. He points to the trunk, wants to know what's in the trunk. And I think, here we go again. I get back to the trunk. I open the trunk up. He wants to know what's in the box. And I said, it's Bibles. And he said, can I have one? I haven't seen one since I was a little boy. My grandmother had one. Can I have one? What an advantage that we have. We can buy Bibles and study aids in abundance. We can attend Bible classes. We can go to gospel meetings with complete freedom. But the question is, what do we do with it? It's possible to come to Bible classes and still not be really taking advantage of them. Any of us can sit through something. But to really soak and and want to exercise that out. In Hebrews the fifth chapter in verse 12. There the writer in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 12 says, By this time, and by the way, I always highlight those words, by this time. The Lord does not expect you to be where you can't be in your Bible knowledge. But where should you be by this time? If you've been a Christian five years, how much should you know by now? Or 10, or 15, or 20? Where should you be by this time? For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. You're still sucking on a bottle, he says, basically. You're still partaking of milk. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern between good and evil. You take it and you exercise it out. You're you're putting it to work. You think about it and you meditate on it. We won't turn there, but you know 1 Timothy Timothy 4, rather, Timothy is told to, to give heed to the things that he has. Uh, Give yourself entirely to things like reading and meditating. And then he says that your progress may be evident to all. You can make tremendous growth, but you got to take it and you got to read it and you got to meditate on it. Susan and I have cows now back home. I don't know much about them. I know they have four stomachs. 
And I know that when you see them out there in the pasture and they're standing and they're just tearing away at the grass, that's really all they're doing. They're just tearing it. They're not eating it. They send it down to their stomachs. And then whenever they're in a quiet spot, later in the day, they'll lay down a lot of times and they bring it back up. It's called chewing the cud. You'll see my tail. <laughs> That's what we do. We tear, 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 trying to get as much as we can. And then later on, we bring it back. We chew on it, get everything that we can get out of it, and then send it back down to be digested for good. Apply it and live it. Because if you don't, you can lose it. Would you turn to Hebrews 2 and the lesson will soon be yours? In Hebrews chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Again, the warning in Hebrews, he says here, Therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things that we've heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape who neglect so great a salvation, who at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him, God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. This is another one of those contrasts. Those Old Testament people had the word spoken through angels. We have the word spoken through the Son of God. And if they did not escape, when they rebelled, when they left it, how shall we escape of whom much is given, much will be required? And let me tell you, it's true what you don't use, you can lose. I'm thinking of a place that I know well. I can't give too many details, but there was a man there that for a long time had been slipping. Maybe a lot of it wasn't known, but he was slipping. He was, he was leaving. He was falling away and no doubt not giving himself as he should to the word. A man's hardly in the Bible one day and gone the next. But in Bible class, he was still there sitting on the pew. And they were talking about the wise and foolish builders. Wise man built his house. Well, you know. And uh, the teacher just pointed and said, uh, how about, if, uh, you, um, how about if you give us a little summary of the wise and foolish builders? He said, isn't that where one of them built their house out of straw and the other one built their house out of wood? That's three little pigs. And you think, how can somebody just lose that? Build his house upon the rock. Build his house upon the sand. How can we lose it? By not using it. What's that premise? An advantage is not an advantage unless we take advantage of it. One more thing. In Mark 16, Jesus said, Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes... And is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. There it is. You've had the advantage of hearing it today. Put your faith in Jesus. Trust in the cross. Repent of your sins. Confess that you believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And bury that old man and rise to walk in newness of life. Can't say you haven't heard What's that? An advantage is not an advantage unless you take advantage of it. What advantage then? If you're here and you need to respond to the gospel, we sing now to encourage you in your obedience to the truth. Would you surrender your life to Jesus today? We urge you to come while we stand and as we sing.